there's a few factors that affect the rate of an SN2 reaction. The first one is the reactivity of the substrate. Now, that has to do a lot with the ability of the leaving group to leave. And there's three factors at play during that process. And recall, as we go through this, recall that a weaker base strength results in a better leaving group, right? Weaker bases are better leaving groups. So when we look at this down below, here we have our nucleophile. Right, so nucleophile comes over, grabs our carbon, leaving group leaves. The first thing that's nice to have is a leaving group needs to be electron withdrawing. Now, what that does is it puts a delta plus on our carbon right here. Now, with that delta plus there, it helps pull in the nucleophile. So, delta plus here. All right. Now, the second thing that happens is we enter this transition state. As we come in here, that leaving group needs to be polarizable. And that allows the leaving group to be partially bonded to the carbon in that transition state. Now, the net effect of this is that it lowers the activation energy. Okay. Now, the third thing that needs to happen is that leaving group needs to be stable once it leaves with a pair of electrons. And to determine the stability there, we look at the same factors that we looked at to determine whether or not we have a strong acid, right? It's the stability of the conjugate base that matters there. So we're looking at the stability of this, guys. All right, so things like polarizability, that helps us out in step number two, and it helps us out in step number three. The other thing that affects the reaction for this is steric hindrance on the substrate. Now remember, we have to do this backside attack, right? So in all of these cases, our nucleophile here, right, I'll put a negative charge there, coming in and making a bond to the carbon atom. And it has to do this on that back kind of anti-bonding lobe that's there. So it, the reaction works very well for methyl iodides or methyl halides and primary. So what we'll say down here below is that for this, we have SN2 favored for this. All right, and then let's just jump to the, uh, the next one here. So we're unhindered there, basically. Now we come over here to partially hindered. So here again, here's our nucleophile. It's got its minus charge, and we're coming in, we're doing that backside attack there. Now what I've done here is I've thrown on two R groups. And now you can see that we have some kind of interaction right here. There's some hindrance, depending how this thing is moving around. There's some interaction maybe right there, but we can still make our way into the, to the middle of this um, kind of cluster and make a bond to the carbon. So what we're gonna write down here is SN2 is possible if are the, are the R groups in general, if the R groups are small. So you can imagine if those were really, really big or highly branched, then it's tougher to react at that position. Now, if we're super sterically hindered here, right, we come in here and we have these R groups and we're just blocked entirely, right? So now the nucleophile itself just can't make its way in. So here we say no SN2. We would simply write in R for no reaction. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you guys here is that branching at the beta position can affect the reaction rate too. So let's take a look at an example here. So here's our CH3. Here's our carbon, another carbon here. And then let's put an X here. That's our, that'll be our leaving group. And then let's throw out here an H atom and then another H atom there. But at this position, I want to go ahead and I want to throw on another CH3 and then a third CH3. Now, this carbon right now that I'm coloring in, that's the carbon where this reaction is taking place, right? Remember, X here would be our LG. That's your leaving group. Now, we call that position there, we call that the alpha position, all right? We just go down the alphabet, that's alpha, and that would be the beta position. 
And here we would say that this has a high degree of branching at the beta position, right? So that group right there is the same, for example, as having one of these H's replaced with a really giant group there, right? You know, something really big. And if it's really big right there, then you're hindering that attack as it comes in, as that nucleophile comes in. So down here below, when we look at this, and we go through and, and compare this, right, so this thing reacts about 10 to the 5 times slower than this. So if we take that same carb in there, right, put on our H's, leave everything the same where it's reacting, but put just a CH3 there, right? So this is, the second structure over here is much more reactive than the first structure there. Now just keep an eye out for that as you go through all these problems. Now nucleophilicity matters here too. So it, it, it's an SN2 reaction. It makes sense that nucleophile matters. It's bimolecular also. So SN2 reactions require strong nucleophiles. It turns out as we go through and, and do our analysis that uh, many, many times strong bases are also strong nucleophiles. And we can determine if something is a strong base simply by looking at pKa's, for example. Now, the other thing that matters here too is the solvent choice. So it turns out that polar aprotic solvents work the best. Remember, right, the idea here is that we wanna have that anion free in order to make a bond with the substrate. So we want something polar so everything will dissolve, but we don't want a hydrogen bond with a nucleophile. All right, so as we look at, uh, at the different type of solvents along this row, and the relative reaction rate here. You have methanol with a reaction rate of one, water goes up to seven, DMSO, 13, uh, 130 rather, and um, CH3CN, 5,000. So as you become more aprotic, you get a faster reaction. 